Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a presentation regarding the SECURE Act. I want to thank all of you for attending during this holiday season. Um, it's rare to have an emergency situation such as this to be able to get information out to you very promptly, but we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. If you have colleagues that are unable to join, this recording will be available later, so feel free to ask any of us for a copy of it that you can share to you, those that cannot attend. I also want to thank my colleagues at Wagner Law who uh, include Barry Salkin and Lydia Juan Aber who very diligently worked over the weekend to be able to summarize and, and very carefully analyze this new act. And I also want to thank our members of Congress because this is a long-awaited piece of legislation and it had bipartisan support during some very difficult times and we thank them for reaching this agreement. So what we're going to do today is talk about the SECURE Act, which means setting every community up for retirement enhancement. So I hope you're all set up and feeling enhanced. Uh, this law became effective just last Friday on December 20th when it was signed into law by President Trump. It was part of final appropriations bills so that we could keep our government running during this time and have a good budget, and uh, this was included with it. As mentioned, it had been long awaited. I think most of us thought that we would see this bill more than a year ago. Um, it did have bipartisan support, uh, but it was tied up, among other things, trying to reach an appropriate offsetting amount for revenue enhancement. So for what benefits might be cost here, they were looking for ways to increase the revenue to make it neutral. And with these final negotiations, that was accomplished. So this act, the SECURE Act, really does provide something for everyone. All stakeholders are represented here and also with some offsetting costs. So for plan sponsors, we have the introduction of PEPs, PEPs be, uh, being pooled employer plans, a new form of a MEP, but carries with it no bad apple rule. We also have increased tax credits for small employers to encourage them to establish new plans. We have fiduciary relief for selecting the lifetime income provider. Again, another long-awaited, very problematic area, and we have a resolution. Against that, we have bigger penalties, and we'll be talking to you about those. For workers, we have the fact that auto enroll caps have been raised. We have new eligibility for part-timers, another long-standing area of difficulty. And we have access to savings for adoptions or births. For savers in general, we have the RMD age has been delayed to age 72, putting them in more reality in terms of most of us don't lead our lives around a question of when we turn age 70 and a half. Um, IRA contributions are no longer capped by age. That is a huge, huge development, and we'll be talking about that today. Lifetime income options have become portable. That is a tremendous innovation. We're really pleased to see it. And against that, we have the elimination of the stretch IRA. Now, throughout this presentation and the legislation, we see common themes about fiduciary responsibilities. Today, we're going to try to highlight these issues along with some other changes and attempt to provide some insight on what problems these changes address. We'll end with a list of some options for you to consider while planning for your employee benefit plan needs as well as planning needs for your individual plan participants. So here we go. As mentioned, probably the biggest part of this legislation and the one that most people thought it primarily concerned was a new arrangement for MEPs. I thought I'd start with just a quick summary of the law behind MEPs. First of all, a MEP is a multiple employer plan. 
And note that that's a multiple plan, so a multiple employer. So more than one employer, but it's not a multi-employer plan. Multi-employer plan being those that are established by a union, typically a collectively bargained plan. So a multiple employer plan is one in which unrelated employers come together to sponsor a single plan. Now the IRS and the DOL have traditionally taken different views about MEPS in that the DOL requires a common nexus among the participating employers. So there has to be something that pulls them together that is separate and apart from maintaining the plan. So under the DOL rules, you can't just join together and say, hey, I want to go with some completely unrelated people and form our own plan without any other thing to bring them together. And so typically, METs have been established by associations. And so for instance, just to pull one out of the hat, the American Medical Association might be the sponsor of a plan by which their individual members can join. And the members that are employers become the, sponsor, the participating plan sponsors. And this is a way that for using the medical office as an example, there might be a lot of small employers out there that can then come together and get the same kind of efficiencies that a larger plan may have. Now these that are limited to associations are called closed MEPs. The IRS also recognizes MEPs in general, but they don't impose the same uh, nexus rules. And so if you are a plan among multiple employers, and if it otherwise meets the qualification rules, then these open MEPs, as they're called, remain qualified plans. So under these arrangements, all employees of each of the participating employers who maintain the plan are treated as though they're employed by a single employer. Now offsetting that is a really, really big impediment. And that is that if a given employer engages in some error that might disqualify the plan, it does disqualify the entire plan under the Internal Revenue Code rules. This is a huge risk and a big deterrent to many employers wanting to be part of a MEP because they don't want to be accountable for having a plan going down by the heirs of some individual that they don't even know or have otherwise have a relationship with. So this is known as the bad apple rule. So if there's one bad apple in the barrel, we gotta throw out the entire bunch. We're not really aware of the IRS taking advantage of this. Uh, typically when there have been violations, they've worked through other ways to address the problem, but it's out there and it's been a huge, huge deterrent. Now outside of the bad apple rule, METs have been attractive for a lot of reasons, one of which is for risk mitigation. Often these arrangements are ones that have third parties that serve as the 316 plan administrator as well as the 338 investment manager. So when that happens, the other fiduciaries are relieved of fiduciary responsibility for their actions. You still have accountability to make a proper selection of your provider as well as continuing to monitor their activities. But as long as they're acting appropriately within the scope of their authority, you're not responsible to try to second guess those decisions. And so for that risk mitigation element has been a very big attractor. Um, also, it's thought that when you can combine a bunch of small employer plans into one big plan, there should be some cost efficiencies also. You're administering only one plan, you have one committee member, uh, one committee group potentially to visit, potentially one investment uh, menu. Um, and potentially, you can use the purchasing power of the total assets of the plan to get some pricing that may not be otherwise available to those small employers. These cost efficiencies haven't always been true, but it's certainly a hope and was one of the attractive elements of these arrangements. So in the, fate, in the light of all of that, enter 
the pooled employer plan, now part of this SECURE Act. This is the PEP, a new type of MEP. Now with the PEP, the prior law remains largely unchanged. A pooled employer plan has been added, the PEP, but the bad apple rule no longer applies to either type of plan. This is a huge, huge innovation. So let's talk about what types of MEPs are covered under this arrangement. So what the SECURE Act did was added new Internal Revenue Code Section 413E. Now 413 is the provision that established that multiple employer plans can be qualified plans. It goes on now to state, however, in sub E, that a MEP will not fail to be qualified due to the errors of a given employer if, and so this is the elimination of that bad apple rule, if it is a defined contribution plan, so this doesn't apply to defined benefit plans, that is, quote, maintained by employers that have a common interest other than maintaining the plan, close quote. So in other words, a closed MEP under current law. Alternatively, the arrangement will also avoid that bad apple rule if it has a pooled plan provider, a PPP. So what's a PPP? A PPP is someone or entity that is a named fiduciary of the plan as a 316 plan administrator. 316 is the section of ERISA that defines who is a plan administrator. It is a fiduciary of the plan. Now that PPP must acknowledge their status as a PPP in writing. And so this is similar to what we've seen for 338. You, uh, you are that fiduciary, but only if you specify in writing that you accept that accountability. Now that PPP must perform all the duties of a plan administrator, and the law even specifies, including plan testing, that may be required to keep the plan qualified. The PPP must ensure <clears throat> that all persons who handle plan assets are appropriately bonded. Now this should be nothing new either. Anybody that handles plan assets should be bonded under ERISA. What is different is that for this purpose, the ERISA bond has been increased to $1 million. So this is a good thing. It's a protection for the plan, and it's also a protection for those that uh, work in this role because the standard ERISA bonds, frankly, are, are rather low. The PPP must also provide to participating employers whatever disclosures and other information that the DOL might require including any items to help the employers select or monitor that PPP. And so here's another interesting element in that this kind of has the ring of like the 408B2 requirements in that as a provider to a plan, you have an obligation to send information that will help the plan fiduciaries decide if you're the person that should be selected and once selected, that they can monitor your activities to make sure that you're doing your job well. And so everybody gets to meet their fiduciary accountabilities. A good thing here also is that these disclosures can be made in electronic format. So hooray for that. The Congress recognized up front that there's a huge cost saving and a lot of administrative simplicity if these things can go out electronically. Now that PPP must also register with the Department of Treasury, and it will be subject to audit, examination, and investigation by both the IRS and the DOL. So all very good things here. So that PPP, pooled provider, uh, performs services for a pooled employer plan, the PEP. So what is that? 
uh, it's one in which uh, the plan itself designates that pool plan provider. Remember that they must be designated in writing and they must accept that, uh, that status in writing. Now also, the PEP must designate a trustee that will collect contributions to the plan and will hold the plan assets. So this is a big departure. So typically, the uh, employer that sponsors a plan often serves as that plan trustee. We don't always see a lot of third-party external trustees to plans. But here is a part of the requirement that you're not part of a PEP unless you do designate that outside tr trustee. Now, who's qualified to do that? Well, we have already an established group of people that perform that service in the sense of banks. Of course, they are qualified trustees. But also included are qualified custodians for IRAs. So here's another opportunity for the broker-dealers who are qualified custodians for IRAs. They can now expand their services and serve as the trustee for a PEP. Now these trustees must implement collection procedures that are reasonable, diligent, and systematic. Now these words should be very familiar also because they go to the core of what is a prudent process that any good fiduciary should follow. So nothing new here either. So each employer, once you have a PEP, each employer is a co-sponsor of the PEP. Now interestingly, the statute also says that the PPP, the provider, is the plan sponsor. So I think we're going to look for a little more clarification regarding uh, the various responsibilities between an employer as a co-sponsor and the PPP as the sponsor of the plan. Each employer also retains fiduciary responsibility to appoint and monitor the PPP. Again, that's standard fiduciary obligation, but you're going to be able to do it with the help of the information that that PPP is going to be ordered to provide. And the plan fiduciary retains responsibility to invest plan assets unless it's otherwise been delegated. And as we've talked about, uh, 338s are very common in the MEP land, so that may carry over into the PEP world also. So we're going to take our paring knife and cut out the one bad apple rule if you're a qualified MEP. So the non-compliant employer, not the plan and not other employers, will be responsible for any liabilities relating to the plan that is attributable to its employees. So everybody's accountable for their own mistakes and no longer will a given participating employer be at risk for the mistakes made by these unknown people that are part of the same plan. Now if that happens, there's a procedure for spitting off assets of the non-compliant employer. So they can do that by sending them off to a qualified plan of its own that it otherwise sponsors, or it can create one, or there might be a successor plan involved, or the assets can be distributed to the participants via an IRA. There is, of course, an exception if Treasury determines that it's the best interest for the plan participants to keep the assets where they are inside the plan. Good news also, IRS guidance is coming, and the very best of them is that the IRS will issue a model plan document. That is great news. So we're going to have some really good language to be able to follow and not flounder around and try to, try to create one. <laughs> the IRS is going to issue more guidance also. So they're going to tell us about the duties and other actions required by the PPP. And hopefully among them will be that question about what is their status as the sponsor of the plan. They're going to be developing procedures for how to terminate a plan that fails to meet the requirements of a covered MEP. And they're going to identify appropriate cases for corrective action against any kind of non-compliant employer. 
So that will be good too. So we can have some idea of what are the bad things that can happen and hopefully when we know that we can more carefully avoid them. Until then, it's good faith reliance for all. You somehow switched to the end, so let me get back. I apologize. All right. With this comes more disclosure. There will be a particular 5500 for a pet, and the 5500 must list all of the participating employers in the plan. Uh, it must provide a good faith estimate of the percentage of total contributions that are made by each of those participating employers. So you'll be able to see what is the relative uh, volume of a given employer's contribution to the plan assets as well as a specific amount. So they must aggregate account balances attributable to each employer. They'll be identifying information about that pooled plan provider. Again, some of that more information that we're looking for to be able to make a good fiduciary decision about selecting that provider. And there will be simplified reporting for a plan with fewer than 100 participants or Another small employer plan might be one with fewer than 1,000 participants if no employer has more than 100 participants. So this avoids an, a large employer trying to bind with a bunch of smaller employers to be able to avoid their accountability for that single employer plan. So on to other news. So in trying to encourage more retirement savings for all individuals. The SECURE Act includes some increased tax credits available for small employers. Now you may recall that some time ago a new credit was created for the expenses related to small employers who start up a new plan. Again, that's generally employers with up to 100 employees. But the cap for that credit has been increased. And so now it's the greater of $500, where it is now, or the lesser of $250 for each non-highly compensated employee eligible to participate, or $5,000. So this is a huge change. And so the small employer can get up to a $5,000 credit, that's real dollars, uh, for sponsoring a new plan. With that is an additional credit. So $500 credit can be added annually for up to three years if the plan includes an automatic enrollment feature. Now this new credit applies even if that auto enroll feature is added after the plan has been adopted. So if you got the credit before or didn't get the credit before, if you want to get it now and don't have an auto enroll feature, those employers can consider that. Both are available. Uh, each is effective essentially now, so for plan years beginning after 1231. Another huge innovation revolves around the question of lifetime income options. Those options have now become portable, which is great news. This responds to the dilemma of the poor plan participant that might enjoy these benefits in a given plan, but the participant has moved on. They're no longer with that employer, and now the benefit is stuck in the plan that they left. So let's say an individual wants to say, I want to move my annuity but to do so and get it out of that plan with the employer that I'm no longer associated with, I'm going to have to cash it in and I'm going to have to incur a bunch of cash surrender charges. On the other hand, an employer might decide that they've offered this benefit and now maybe it's not the greatest or maybe I'm a little concerned about this annuity provider. So I want to switch so this is no longer a benefit available under the plan. 
Well, again, if it's no longer an appropriate plan investment, what's going to happen? Is everybody supposed to then cash out these annuity contracts and take surrender charges or market value adjustments if there are any? So this has been a huge deterrent to employers adding uh, guaranteed income or, uh, excuse me, in, uh, lifetime income investments in their plans. Um, it's, it's been sad in the sense that we've all learned that the market does not go up forever. There are people that want guaranteed income, and yet it's just not been very available in the largest asset that most individuals have. So they've now been made portable, which is a really, really welcome change. So the participant can get a distribution in the form of a lifetime income investment if it's no longer an authorized investment option under the plan, which we've talked about, and the distribution is made to another retirement plan or an IRA through a direct rollover. So good news, we could do a direct rollover. Or if it's in the form of an annuity contract, it can be directly distributed to that participant. So this applies to tax-qualified defined contribution plans, the 403Bs, and 457Bs, effective for plan years beginning after next week. This is a wonderful new innovation. I did it again. So one, excuse me, I'll back up one more time. All right, so also with lifetime income options comes an obligation for some disclosures. This also has been a long-standing problem that everybody has been looking for a solution, but it's been a real struggle. So we know that generally people get an, a statement of their account balance in their plans that says, you have, let's say, $250,000. Well, if someone's age 50 and they say, oh, that's great, I've got $250,000 coming, what does that really mean? When I retire, what can I buy with that? I have no idea what that means in real purchasing power at a later time. So figuring out what that value is in the form of an income stream is a really complicated process. And so it's subject to a lot of different assumptions. Um, people can very easily disagree on what assumptions are important or how they're utilized. And yet, it is information that is really important to plan participants. And so, it's coming. So now, in the future, plan benefit statements, at least once a year, should include a statement which shows what the monthly value of those benefits are in the form of an annuity or a joint survivor annuity. So, within one year of enactment, so that will be pretty soon, the DOL is in charge with telling us what are the permissible assumptions. You know, what is the interest rate that you're going to assume? You know, what is the expected life of somebody? How long are these things supposed to last? That, those assumptions should be defined by the DOL. They're also going to issue a model disclosure. Again, fantastic news. So, uh, we can take these very, very complicated arrangements and disclose them in the way that the DOL can tell us. And they're going to issue some interim final rules. Very, very positive development. There's a third element regarding lifetime income options. And that includes the fiduciary safe harbor for selecting annuity providers. Now, as we've talked about, annuities can be extremely complex products, and they come from complex companies that are very difficult to evaluate. It's hard to look at an insurance company and consider questions of solvency or, or, or do they exercise good claims-paying practices, and 
You know, are they nice people to deal with? And how well are their service organizations? It's just a really difficult, complex process. So from the plan sponsor's perspective, they can feel like, hey, gee, I, I really worked hard. And I, I went through a very uh, appropriate due diligence process to select a good insurance carrier. Um, and I selected a good annuity. But now my participants' benefits are wrapped up in a permanent vehicle that's frankly not as good as what might be available now. So what do I do about that? And we also continue to hear the screams of agony of the poor plan sponsors that suffered in light of the executive life failure. So fiduciary relief is now here. So the fiduciary must continue to make an appropriate, due diligent, prudent selection. But they can rely upon the written representations from the insurers regarding their financial standing. And these are the things that they submit to the states that regulate them. The fiduciary is not required to select the lowest cost contract. It's specifically in the statute that says that. So in making the selection of what is a good annuity, the plan sponsor can consider other features and benefits and the attributes of the insurer. There is no duty to continue to monitor the insurance product once selected. This also is very welcome news. So the fiduciaries are not required to review the appropriateness of a selection after that purchase has been made. So again, it's a permanent contract. The money's in there. It, it's stuck. So it, as long as there's a good decision made at the time, we're not going to penalize somebody if conditions change later. And fiduciaries are deemed to conduct a periodic review if they obtain written representations from the insurer on at least an annual basis. So this is effective right now upon the date of enactment. SECURE also gives many enhancements for savers themselves. The big one is that it repeals the maximum age for contributions to a traditional IRA. I frankly didn't see this one coming, and maybe I missed it, but this is a big one. So no longer are you saying that you have to stop IRA contributions when one reaches 70 and a half. So as long as you have earned income, and many people will, because many people are working into longer years and are no longer uh, retiring at age 65. So contributions can continue to a traditional IRA. The required minimum distribution date has also changed. It's been increased from age 70 and a half to the year after one attains age 72. Now, this isn't a big change, however, Psychologically, it's big in that most of us don't plan our lives around when do we turn age 70 and a half. And it also recognizes the fact that people do tend to work longer, so they don't have to be forced to have distributions. Um, now, this opens up a wealth of planning opportunities, and a lot of care needs to be exercised. So theoretically, deferrals are going to continue over a longer period. And a later distribution will conceivably be larger because it's been deferred longer, but maybe over a shorter period of time because the person will continue to live the same time, perhaps. And this is combined with the potentially increased deferrals because there's no longer the age cap. So all of this takes some careful review. But the good news also is that the IRA, IRS will be updating the mortality table. So we'll have better assumptions as far as one's expected lives. But here's the event, uh, kicker on this. The stretch IRA is eliminated, at least for some. So you might recall that distributions have to start when uh, the, within the year after the decedent uh, dies and can't 
be for more than five years unless it's over the lifetime. Now that five-year rule has been changed to 10 years. Now this applies to defined contribution plans and to IRAs, but not to defined benefit plans. So why not defined benefit plans? Well, conceivably because defined benefit plans have a form of benefit of either that lifetime annuity or a lump sum, so there's really kind of not a need to be able to do this. These rules are applicable to deaths after 2019. So it doesn't apply to a distribution made within one year of the participant's death to an eligible designated beneficiary for payments made over that beneficiary's life for a period not to exceed his or her life expectancy. So these are the rules that were previously available to the surviving spouse. So who is one of these eligible designated beneficiaries? Well, they include the surviving spouse and any child under the age of majority. But once that child attains the age of majority, they have to switch over and then start a 10-year payout time. It applies to the disabled or the chronically ill and any person who is not more than 10 years younger than the participant or the IRA owner. And presumably this is because if you're, if you're giving a distribution to that type of beneficiary, there's not a huge age difference between the decedent and the beneficiary, and therefore we're not looking at abuses of trying to extend the payout over and over and over for a long period of time. This 10-year rule applies on the death of the eligible designated beneficiary, so you can't extend it again. So that was the big revenue enhancer in terms of eliminating that stretch IRA and being able to tax plans um, uh, with uh, sooner. Another big change is that the plan can now be adopted when the tax return is due. So you're all familiar with existing law that requires that if you're going to establish a, a new plan, uh, it can't be treated for the taxable year unless it's done by the last day of the taxable year. Now a new plan can be treated as if it were in effect for a tax year if it's adopted before the due date of the tax return, including extensions. So very good news here, and it's you know, more similar to like IRAs are done. So this is another huge, huge uh, planning opportunity in that employers considering adopting a plan can wait until they get their tax return together, they can work with their planners, figure out what their year was like, and then retroactively adopt the plan so long as they get it done by the time that the return is due with extensions. This also gives the opportunity for employees to accumulate more savings earlier if they do such an adoption and uh, again meet the the primary needs of the SECURE Act, which was to give more retirement benefits to people. There have been some changes regarding 401ks. Uh, first is a new auto-enroll cap. So just as it's always been, the first year of a plan year, uh, the first plan year after a default automatic uh, contribution rate is selected, it cannot exceed 10% in that first year. But there is now a safe harbor for automatic enrollments uh, so that it increases them from 10% to 15% for years after the participant initially enrolled. And this applies again for plans beginning just next year. Um, also for 401k plans, uh, there's no more safe harbor contribution notice. So the SECURE Act eliminates the safe harbor notice requires for plans that uh, provide non-elective contributions. So a plan can switch to a safe harbor plan uh, that includes the non-elective contributions 
And they can do that at the 3% level if they make that switch any time before the 30th day before the close of the plan year. Alternatively, they can continue to make the switch after that 30th day before the end of the following plan year. But if they do that, then the contribution must be increased to 4%. And this is effective for plan years beginning next year. Now, the third thing involving 401ks is a little bit odd to me, um, but they have eliminated credit card plan no loans. So I'm not aware of many plans that might do this. I'm not even sure that that would be a prudent thing to even have. However, uh, apparently there were plans out there that allowed people to take loans via credit cards so that they could essentially erode away their retirement savings by taking out a whole bunch of little bitty plan loans through the credit card. So these are now prohibited. They're treated as a distribution. Uh, and again, that's effective right now. There's more access to uh, uh, retirement savings for people that are currently employed. Uh, for those that have an adoption or a birth of a child, there's a new $5,000 distribution that can be made. Now this is limited to people that are adopting children under age 18 or who are physically or mentally incapable of self-support, but it does not apply to adopting the child of the taxpayer's spouse. So this is done individually, so if you have um, more than one child, you'll get more than one uh, distribution. And uh, this is available even if the plan otherwise doesn't provide for in-service distributions. If this is made available, you have to be able to allow repayment of the benefit. Um, and again, it starts with plan years next year. The long-standing problem of what do we do for long-service part-time employees? Well, eligibility rules have changed. So participants become eligible upon the earlier of standard rule, one year of service, 1,000 hours of service, or three consecutive years of 500 or more hours of service. So the part-timer now becomes eligible to participate in the plan if they have significant enough hours over a longer period of time. You can still employ the age 21 requirement. This does not apply to collectively bargained plans. But once done, the employees that become eligible because of this uh, no longer, you wouldn't have to provide employer contributions for them but they are not subject to the non-discrimination rules, the coverage rules, top-heavy vesting, and uh, the top-heavy benefits. So you can let them into the plan. You don't have to give them, a, you give them an employer benefit, and they won't upset your discrimination testing. Um, there are special uh, effective dates for those. There's another arrangement for soft, frozen, defined benefit plans. Now, in a nutshell, basically this deals with a situation if uh, participants are in a closed plan, um, those participants uh, will continue to accrue benefits if the plan is frozen. But as time goes on, what tends to happen is that lower paid employees have uh, greater attrition. So they fall out, they're no longer participating, they're no longer accruing a benefit, and the plan's left with a disproportionate number of highly compensated employees. So people have been left with a bad choice of, well, gee, now I have to cut off the benefits of these long service employees. So Congress recognized that maybe we shouldn't make them do that, and so they modified the rules for disc discrimination testing for plans that fall in this situation. So some relief there. Now, offsetting all of these great benefits are increased penalties. And I was surprised when I looked at this because I was looking at the Ways and Means Committee report and they show lower penalties than what uh, is in the final bill. So 
must have been over final negotiations, they must have increased the penalties. So these are big ones. So everybody wants to be aware that they're big and uh, plan accordingly and not miss any filings. So if you fail to file a Form 5500 at all, uh, $250 a day, not to exceed, or well, we're going to cap it for you, but we're going to cap it at 150 grand. Failure to file a registration statement can go up to $50,000. Failure to file a required notice of change in status up to 10 grand, and failure to provide a required withholding notice, again, uh, capped at $50,000, but a significant penalty. Uh, along with all of these other goodies, uh, there's the repeal of the Cadillac tax on high-cost group plans and a little other little nits and gnats here and there. We want to leave you with some next action, some things to think about that might help you as you think about this SECURE Act. First of all, watch out for further guidance about open MEPs. Uh, PEPs are, again, long awaited, much welcomed, and we're going to be hearing more about them. We want you to be vigilant about the filing requirements so that you can avoid any of these whopping big new penalties. Now, if you're an employer of a small, excuse me, a long service, part time employee, uh, somebody's got to make sure that they're tracking the hours so that they can uh, properly offer eligibility to those individuals. And uh, we want to encourage all savers to consider the impact of the changes to the stretched IRAs. Uh, lots and lots of work to be done there. There are choices to consider also. Uh, one is if you're an employer, do you want to adopt a new plan even if it's after year end? Lots of opportunities there. Um, if your plan provides for RMDs other than age 72, and I would suspect everyone does, you want to consider whether you want to increase uh, that date. Uh, if you're going to adopt lifetime income options, uh, now's the time to consider them. Uh, decide whether you're going to accept rollovers of those investments into your own plan and consider how you're going to disclose them. You want to think about if you're going to establish a new plan or add an auto enrollment feature if you are in a small employer and want to take advantage of these tax credits. There are liberalized rules for safe harbor non-elective contributions, so that provides some more opportunities. And you might want to think about whether you're going to implement qualified birth or adoption distributions. I want to thank all of you for attending. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, we'd be happy to provide it. Or if you have any specific questions, send them along. Feel free to contact any Wagner Law Group attorney. You'll see the link there. Uh, we're all listed there. And again, I wish all of you a very, very happy holiday season, and um, I hope you're secure in your retirement. Thanks all.